English for kids. Hello, hello, hello. I do want to read the story Tokyo with you, for you, at you, to you, um, in hopes that a number of you will work with it. Uh, I also just want to refresh my own sense of the story. I really loved it last year, and so many of my students loved it as well. We are in particular looking for theme within this story, right? And I've been on you about finding complex themes, not just your standard uh, don't judge a book by its cover type cliche themes, which sometimes those apply, but I think we're better than that now. Uh, the general tip that I give for locating theme is, A, don't force it. So don't just read the story looking for the lessons, right? Just let the story happen. Read it. Then what I like to do is ask myself, what was the key conflict in that story? How did that key conflict resolve or did it resolve? And then from that answer, whether or not the key conflict resolved, uh, then we'll try to gain a, a life lesson uh, that's sort of specific to that conflict. So you see how that narrows us down? So first of all, just let us let us read this story. Then we can talk about conflict. Then we can hopefully talk about theme. Keep in mind the context of this story. It's completely critical. Post-World War II, Tokyo. If you don't know, Tokyo was uh, flattened by fire bombs in World War II. Um, you can look up the wreckage, but this would have been a city that needed to be entirely rebuilt. And um, if you look up the author Fumiko Ayashi, she lived from 1904 to 1951. So she would have written this what, between 1945 and 1951? It's crazy, I couldn't even find that information and it's not in our book here. Uh, maybe I should have looked harder, but this is for sure a reaction to, uh, to the war, to her country being devastated by all kinds of craziness and then a war. Uh, the only other thing I would add to you is, that, so we have this main character, Rio, this, this uh, lovely woman, and we do learn pretty quickly that her husband is gone. He's been in a camp in Siberia. Uh, so that means he's a prisoner of war within World War II, taken prisoner most likely by the Russians, right? Uh, I guess there's a chance he was in conflict with the Chinese and then was taken prisoner by his some Chinese forces, whatever was la uh, left over, but uh, probably the Russians and probably he's not alive. I think it's something like 10% of Russian P POWs taken by Russian forces survived that captivity, largely because the Russians couldn't afford to feed themselves, largely due to some really poor management by Joseph Stalin of all resources and manpower uh, so they could hardly take care of prisoners of war. Okay, Tokyo, Fumiko Hayashi. I'll do my best with pronunciations. Just hang in there, it's a long story, but you have to read a long story for theme. <clears throat> it was a bitty windy, windy afternoon. As Rio hurried down the street with her rucksack, she kept to the side where the pale sun shone down over the roofs of the office buildings. Every now and then she looked about curiously, at a building, at a parked car, at one of those innumerable bomb sites scattered through downtown Tokyo. Glancing over a boarding, Rio saw a huge pile of rusty iron. Next to it, a cabin with a glass door. A fire was burning within, and the warm sound of the crackling wood reached where she was standing. In front of the cabin stood a man in overalls with a red kerchief about his head. There was something pleasant about this tall fellow, and Rio screwed up her courage to call out, Tea for sale. Would you like some tea, please? Tea, said the man. Tea, said Rio with a nervous smile. It's Shizuoko tea. She stepped in through an opening in the boarding and, unfastening the straps of her rucksack, put it down by the cabin. Inside, she could see a fire burning in an iron stove. 
From a bar above hung a brass kettle with a wisp of steam rising from the spout. Excuse me, said Rio. But would you mind if I came in and warmed myself by your stove a few minutes? It's freezing out, and I've been walking for miles. Of course you can come in, said the man. Close the door and get warm. He pointed towards the stool, which was his only article of furniture, and sat down on a packing case in the corner. Rio hesitated a moment. Then she dragged her rucksack into the cabin and, crouching by the stove, held up her hands to the fire. You'll be more comfortable on that stool, said the man, glancing at her attractive face, flushed in the sudden warmth, and at her shabby attire. Surely this isn't what you usually do, hawk tea from door to door. <sighs> oh yes, it's how I make my living, Rio said. I was told that this was a good neighborhood but I've been walking around here since early morning and have only managed to sell one packet of tea. I'm about ready to go home now, <laughs> but I thought I'd have my lunch somewhere on the way. Well, you're perfectly welcome to stay here and eat your lunch, said the man. Don't worry about not having your tea or having sold your tea, he added, smiling. It's all a matter of luck, you know. You'll probably have a good day tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> <clears throat> The kettle came to a boil with a whistling sound. As he unhooked it from the bar, Rio had a chance to look about her. She took in the boarded ceiling black with soot, the blackboard by the window, the shelf for family gods on which stood a potted sakaki tree. The man took a limp-looking packet from the table and, unwrapping it, dis disclosed a piece of cod. A few minutes later, the smell of baking fish permeated the cabin. Come on, said the man. Sit down and have your meal. Rio took her lunchbox out of the rucksack and seated herself on the stool. Selling things is never much fun, is it, remarked the man, turning the cot over on the grill. Tell me, how much do you get for a hundred grams of that tea? I should get 35 yen to make any sort of profit. The people who send me the stuff often mix in bad tea, so I'm lucky if I can get 30 yen. In Rio's lunchbox were two small fish covered with some boiled barley and a few bean paste pickles. She began eating. Where do you live? The man asked her. In the Shitaya district. Actually, I don't know one part of Tokyo from another. I've only been here a few weeks and a friend's putting me up until I find something better. The cod was ready now. He cut it in two and gave Rio half, adding potatoes and rice from a platter. Rio smiled and bowed slightly in thanks, then took out a bag of tea from her rucksack and poured some into a paper handkerchief. Do put this into the kettle, she said, holding it out to him. He shook his head and smiled, showing his white teeth. Good Lord, no, it's far too expensive. Quickly, Rio removed the lid and poured the tea in before he could stop her. <laughs> Laughing, the man went to fetch a teacup and a mug from the shelf. What about your husband, he asked while arranging them on the packing case. You're married, aren't you? Oh, yes, I am. My husband's still in Siberia. That's why I have to work like this. Rio's thoughts flew to her husband, from whom she had not heard for six years. By now, he had come to seem so remote that it required an effort to remember his looks or the once familiar sound of his voice. She woke up each morning with a feeling of emptiness and desolation. At times, it seemed to Rio that her husband had frozen into a ghost in that subarctic Siberia, a ghost or a thin white pillar, or just a breath of frosty air. Nowadays, no one any longer mentioned the war, and she was almost embarrassed to let people know that her husband was still a prisoner. It's funny, the man said. The fact is, I was in Siberia myself. I spent three years chopping wood near the Amur River. I only managed to get sent home last year. Oh, it's all in a matter of luck. It's tough on your husband, but it's just as tough on you. <laughs> You've really been repatriated from Siberia? You don't seem any worse for it, Rio said. Well, I don't know about that, the man shrugged his shoulders. Anyway, as you see, I'm still alive. Rio closed her lunchbox, and as she did so, she studied him. There was a simplicity and directness about this man that made her want to talk openly in a way that she found difficult with more educated people. Got any kids, he said? Yes, a boy of six. He should be at school but I've had difficulty getting him registered here in Tokyo. These officials certainly know how to make life complicated for people. The man untied his kerchief, wiped the cup and the mug with it, and poured out the steaming tea. It's good stuff, this, he said, sipping noisily. Do you like it? 
It's not the best quality, you know. Only 210 yen is a kilo wholesale. But you're right, it's quite good. The wind had grown stronger while they were talking. It whistled over the tin roof of the cabin. Rio glanced out of the window, stealing herself for her long walk home. I'll have some of your tea, 750 grams, the man told her, extracting two crumbled hundred yen notes from the pocket of his overalls. Don't be silly, said Rio. You can have it for nothing. Oh, no, that won't do. Business is business. He forced the money into her hand. Well, if you're ever in this part of the world again, come in and have another chat. I should like to, said Rio, glancing around the tiny cabin. But you don't live here, do you? Oh, but I do. I look after that iron out there and help load the trucks. I'm here most of the day. He opened a door under the shelf, disclosing a sort of cubby hole containing a bed neatly made up. Rio noticed a colored postcard of the 50 bells of Yamada tacked to the back of the door. My, you fixed it up nicely, she said, smiling. You're really quite snug here, aren't you? She wondered how old he could be. From that day on, Rio came regularly to the Yotsugi district to sell tea. Each time she visited the cabin on the bomb site, she learned that the man's name was Suruishi Yoshio. Almost invariably, he had some small delicacy waiting for her to put in her lunchbox. A pickled plum, a piece of beef, a sardine. Her business began to improve, and she acquired a few regular customers in the neighborhood. A week after their first meeting, she brought along her boy, Ryukichi. Suruishi chatted with the child for a while and then took him out for a walk. When they returned, Ryukichi was carrying a large caramel cake. He's got a good appetite, this youngster of yours, said Suruishi, patting the boy's close-cropped head. Rio wondered vaguely whether her new friend was married. In fact, she found herself wondering about various aspects of his life. She was now 29, and she realized with a start that this was the first time she'd been seriously interested in any man but her husband. Suruishi's easy, carefree temperament somehow appealed to her, but she took great care not to let him guess that. A little later, Suruishi suggested taking Ryo and Ryokichi to see Asukusa, Asakusa on his next free day. They met in front of the information booth in Ueno Station, Suruishi wearing an ancient gray suit that looked far too tight, Ryo clad in a blue dress of kimono material and a light brown coat. In spite of her cheap clothes, she had about her something youthful and elegant as she stood there in the crowded station. Beside the tall, heavy Suruishi, she looked like a schoolgirl off on a holiday. In her shopping bag lay their lunch, bread, oranges, and seaweed stuffed with rice. So they're going shopping in this, they're in this shopping district in, in Tokyo. That's their big outing at Asakusa. <laughs> well, let's hope it doesn't rain, said Suruishi, putting his arm lightly around Ryo's waist as he steered her through the crowd. <laughs> they took the subway to Asakusa Station then walked from the Matsuya, Matsuya department store to the Niten Shinto gate past hundreds of tiny stalls. The Asakusa district was quite different from what Ryo had imagined. She was amazed when Tsuruishi pointed to a small red lacquered temple and told her that this was the home of the famous Asakusa goddess of mercy. In the distance, she could hear the plaintive wail of a trumpet and a saxophone emerging from some loudspeaker. It mingled strangely with the sound of the wind whistling through the branches of the ancient Sakaki trees. They made their way through the old clothes market and came to a row of food stalls squeezed tightly against each other beside the Asakusa pond. Here the air was redolent with the smell of burning oil. Suruishi went to, to one of the stalls and bought Ryukichi a stack, stick of yellow something floss. That part of my story's gone. The boy nibbled at it as the three of them walked down something street, plastered with American-style billboards, advertising restaurants, movies, reviews. It was less than a month since Rio had first noticed Suruishi by his cabin, but she felt as much at ease with him as if she'd known him all her life. Well, it started raining after all, he said, holding out his hand. Rio looked up to see scattered drops of rain falling from the gray sky, so their pre precious excursion would be ruined, she thought. We'd better go in there, said Suruishi, pointing to one of the shops, outside which hung a garish lantern with characters announcing the Merry Tea House. They took seats at a table underneath a ceiling decorated with artificial cherry blossoms. 
The place had a strangely unhomelike atmosphere. They were determined to make the best of it and ordered a pot of tea. Rio distributed her stuffed seaweed, bread, and oranges. It was not long before the meal was finished, and by then it had started raining in earnest. We'd better wait till it lets up a bit, suggested Suruishi. Then I'll take you home. Rio wondered if he was referring to her place or his. She was staying in the cramped apartment of a friend from her hometown and did not even have a room to call her own. Rather than go there, she would have preferred returning to Suruishi's cabin, but that too was scarcely large enough to hold three people. Taking out her purse, she counted her money under the table. The 700 yen should be enough to get shelter for a few hours at an inn. You know what I'd really like, she said. I'd like us to go to a movie and then find some inn and have a dish of food before saying goodbye to each other. But I suppose that's all rather expensive. Yes, I suppose it is, said Suruishi, laughing. Come on, we'll do it all the same. Taking his overcoat off the peg, he threw it over Ryokichi's head and ran through the downpour to a movie theater. Of course, there were no seats. Standing watching the film, the little boy went sound asleep, leaning against Suruishi. The air in the theater seemed to get thicker and hotter every moment. On the roof, they could hear the rain beating down. It was getting dark as they left the theater and hurried through the rain, which pelted down with the swishing sound of banana leaves in a high wind. At last, they found a small inn where the landlord led them to a carpeted room at the end of a drafty passage. Rio took off her wet socks. The boy sat down in a corner and promptly went back to sleep. Here. He can use this as a pillow, said Suruishi, picking up an old cushion from a chair and putting it under Ryukichi's head. From an overflowing gutter above the window, the water poured in a steady stream onto the courtyard. It sounded like a waterfall in some faraway mountain village. Suruishi took out a handkerchief and began wiping Ryo's wet hair. A feeling of happiness coursed through her as she looked up at him. It was as if the rain had begun to wash away all the loneliness which had been gathering within her year after year. She went to see if they could get some food and in the corridor met a maid in western clothes carrying a tea tray. After Rio had ordered two bowls of spaghetti, she and Suruishi sat down to drink their tea, facing each other across an empty brazier. Later, Suruishi came and sat on the floor beside Rio. Leaning their backs against the wall, they gazed out at the darkening, rainy sky. How old are you, Rio? Surishi asked her. I should guess 25. Rio laughed. I'm afraid not, Suru. I'm already an old woman. I'm 29. Oh, so you're a year older than me. My goodness, you're young, said Rio. I thought you must be at least 30. She looked straight at him into his dark, gentle eyes with their bushy brows. He seemed to be blushing slightly. Then he bent forward and took off his wet socks. The rain continued unabated. <clears throat> Presently the maid came with some cold spaghetti and soup. Rio woke the boy and gave him a plate of soup. He was half asleep as he sipped it. Look, Rio, Suruishi said, you might as well all stay the night at this inn. You can't go home in this rain, can you? No, said Rio. I suppose not. Suruishi left the room and returned with a load of quilted bedrolls, which he spread on the floor. At once, the whole room seemed to be full of bedding. Rio tucked up her son in one of the rolls, the boy sleeping soundly as she did so. Then she turned out the light, undressed, and lay down. She could hear Suruishi settling down at the other end of the room. I suppose the people in this inn think we're married, said Suruishi after a while. Yes, I suppose so. It's not very nice of us to fool them. She spoke in jest, but now that she lay undressed in her bedroll, she felt for the first time vaguely disturbed and guilty. Her husband, for some reason, seemed much closer than he had for years. But of course, she was only here because of the rain, she reminded herself. And gradually her thoughts began to wander pleasantly afield, and she dozed off. When she awoke, it was still dark. She could hear Suarishi whispering her name from his corner, and she sat up with a start. Can I come and talk to you for a while? No, Suru, she said. I don't think you should. On the roof, the rain was still pattering down, but the force of the storm was over. Only a trickle was dropping from the gutter into the yard. Under the sound of the rain, she thought she could hear Suruishi sigh softly. Look, Suru, she said after a pause. 
I've never asked you before, but are you married? No, not now, Surarishi said. You used to be? Yes, I used to be. When I got back from the army, I found that my wife was living with another man. Were you angry? Angry? Yes, I suppose I was. Still, there wasn't much I could do about it. She'd left me, and that was that. They were silent again. What should we talk about, Rio asked. Suruishi laughed. Well, there really doesn't seem to be anything special to talk about. That spaghetti wasn't very good, was it? No, one certainly couldn't call it good, and they charged us a hundred yen each for it. It would be nice if you and Ryukichi had your own room to live in, wouldn't it, Suruishi remarked. Oh yes, it would be marvelous. You don't think we might find a room near you? I'd really like to live near you, Suru, you know? It's pretty hard to find rooms these days, especially downtown, but I'll keep a lookout and let you know. You're such a wonderful person, Rio. Me? said Rio, laughing. Don't be silly. Yes, yes, you're wonderful. Really wonderful. Rio lay back on the floor. Suddenly she wanted to throw her arms around Suruishi to feel his body close to hers. She did not dare speak for fear that her voice might betray her. Her breath came almost painfully. Her whole body tingled. Outside the window, an early morning truck clattered past. Where are your parents, Suru? She asked after a while. In the country near Fukuoka. But you have a sister in Tokyo? Yes, she's all alone like you, with two kids to take care of. She's got a sewing machine and makes Western-style clothes. Her husband was killed several years ago in the war in China. War. Always war. Outside the window, Rio could make out the first glimmer of dawn. So their night together was almost over, she thought unhappily. In a way, she wished that Suruishi hadn't given up so easily, and yet she was convinced that it was best like this. If he had been a man she hardly knew, or for whom she felt nothing, she might have given herself to him with no afterthought. With Suruishi, it would have been different. Quite different. Rio, I can't get to sleep. His voice reached her again. I'm wide awake, you know. I suppose I'm not used to this sort of thing. What sort of thing? Why, sleeping in the same room with a girl. Oh, Suru, don't tell me that you don't have girlfriends occasionally. Only professional girlfriends, Rio laughed. Men have it easy, in some ways at least. She heard Suruishi moving about. Suddenly he was beside her, bending over her. Rio did not move, not even when she felt his arms around her, his face against hers. In the dark, her eyes were wide open, and before them bright lights seemed to be flashing. His hot lips were pressed to her cheek. Rio, Rio, it's wrong, you know, she murmured, wrong to my husband. But almost at once she regretted the words. As Suruishi bent over her, she could make out the silhouette of his face against the lightning sky. Bowed forward like that, he seemed to be offering obeisance to some god. Rio hesitated for a moment, and she threw her warm arms about his neck. <laughs> Two days later, Rio set out happily with her boy to visit Suruishi. When she reached the bomb site, she was surprised not to see him before his cabin, his red kerchief tied about his head. Ryukichi ran ahead to find out if he were home and came back in a moment. There are strangers there, Mama. Seized with panic, Rio hurried over to the cabin and peered in. Two workmen were busy piling up Suruishi's effects in a corner. What is it, ma'am? One of them said, turning his head. I'm looking for Suruishi. Oh, don't you know? Suruishi died yesterday. Died, she said. She wanted to say something more, but no words would come. She had noticed a small candle burning on the shelf for family gods, and now she was aware of its somber meaning. Yes, went on the man. He was killed about eight o'clock last night. He went in a truck with one of the men to deliver some iron bars in Omiya, and on their way back, the truck overturned on a narrow bridge. He and the driver were both killed. His sister went to Omiya today with one of the company officials to see about the cremation. Rio stared vacantly before her. Vacantly, she watched the two men piling up Suruishi's belongings. Beside the candle on the shelf, she caught sight of the two bags of tea he had bought from her that first day. Could it be only two weeks ago? One of them was folded over halfway down. The other was still unopened. You were a friend of his, ma'am, I imagine? 
He was a fine fellow, Suru. Funny to think that he needn't have gone to Amiya at all. The driver wasn't feeling well, and Suru said he'd go along to Amiya to help him unload. Crazy, isn't it? After getting through the war in Siberia and all the rest of it, to be killed like that. One of the men took down the postcard of the 50 bells of Yamada and blew the dust off it. Ryo stu stood looking at Tsuruishi's belongings piled on the floor. The kettle, the frying pan, the rubber boots. When her eyes reached the blackboard, she noticed for the first time a message scratched awkwardly in red chalk. Ryo, I waited for you till two o'clock. Back this evening. Automatically, she bowed to the two men and swung the rucksack on her back. She felt numb as she left the cabin. Holding Ryukichi by the hand, but as they pressed the bomb site, the burning tears welled into her eyes. Did that man die, Mama? Yes, he's, he died, Ryo said. Why did he die? He fell into a river. The tears were running down her cheeks now. They poured out uncontrollably as she hurried through downtown streets. They came to an arched bridge over the Sumida River, crossed it, and walked along the bank in the direction of Hakuo. Don't worry if you get pregnant, Surishi had told her after that morning in Asukusa. I'll look after you, whatever happens, Rio. And later on, just before they parted, he'd said, I haven't got much money, but you must let me help you a bit. I can give you 2,000 yen a month out of my salary. He had taken Ryukichi to a shop that specialized in forward goods and bought him a baseball cap with his name written on it. Then the three of them had walked gaily along the streetcar lines, skirting the enormous puddles left by the rain. When they came to fly, when they came to a milk bar, Surishi had taken them in and ordered them each a big glass of milk. Now an icy wind seemed to have blown up from the dark river. A flock of waterfowl stood on the opposite bank, looking frozen and miserable. Barges moved slowly up and down the river. Mama, I want a sketchbook. You said I could have a sketchbook. Later, answered Rio. I'll get you one later. But Mama, we just passed a stall with hundreds of sketchbooks. I'm hungry, Mama. Can't we have something to eat? Later, a little later. They were passing a long row of barrack-like buildings. They must be private houses, she thought. The people who lived there probably all had rooms of their own. From one of the windows, a bedroll had been hung out to air, and inside a woman could be seen tidying the room. Tea for sale, called out Rio softly. Best quality Shizuoka tea. There was no reply, and Rio repeated her call a little louder. I don't want any, said the woman. She pulled in the bedroll and shut the window with a bang. Rio went from house to house, down the row, calling her where, but nobody wanted any tea. Yukichi followed behind, muttering that he was hungry and tired. Rio's rucksack cut painfully into her shoulders, and occasionally she, occasionally she had to stop to adjust the straps. Yet in a way, she almost welcomed the physical pain. The next day, she went downtown by herself, leaving Ryukichi at home. When she came to the bomb site, she noticed that a fire was burning inside the cabin. She ran to the door and walked in. By Suruishi's stove sat an old man in a short workman's overcoat, feeding the flames with firewood. The room was full of smoke, and it was billowing out of the window. What do you want? said the old man, looking round. I've come to sell some Shizuoka tea. Shizuoka tea? I got plenty of good tea right here. Rio turned without a word and hurried off. She thought of asking for the address of Suruishi's sister and of going to burn a stick of incense in his memory. But suddenly this seemed quite pointless. She walked back to the river, which reflected the late afternoon sun, and sat down by a pile of broken concrete. The body of a dead kitten was lying upside down a few yards away. As her thoughts went to Suruishi, she wondered vaguely whether it would have been better never to have met him. No, no, certainly not that. She could never regret knowing him, nor anything that had happened with him, nor did she regret having come to Tokyo. When she had arrived, a month or so before, she'd planned to return to the country if her business was unsuccessful. But now she knew that she would be staying on here in Tokyo. Yes, probably right here in downtown Tokyo, where Suruishi had lived. She got up, swung the rucksack on her back, and walked away from the river. As she strolled along a side street, she noticed a hut which seemed to consist of old boards nailed haphazardly together. Going to the door, she called out. 
Tea for sale. Would anyone like some tea? The door opened, and in the entrance appeared a woman dressed far more poorly than Rio herself. How much does it cost? asked the woman. And then seeing the rucksack, she added, Come in and rest a while, if you like. I'll see how much money we've got left. We may have enough for some tea. Rio went in and put down her rucksack. In the small room, four sewing women were sitting on the floor around an oil stove, working on a mass of shirts and socks. They were women like herself, thought Rio, as she watched their busy needles moving in and out of the material. A feeling of warmth came over her. Oh, love. I love that story. So remember, we talked about, we're going to just read it and feel it. Then you're going to ask yourself, what's the key conflict or what are the two, three key conflicts of the story? Then we're going to ask ourselves, do those conflicts resolve? And if so, how? And if not, how does that happen? From that process, we should be able to start to pull some lessons about uh, what Tokyo has to say about what it is to be a human being. All right, then.